and open to Philippians chapter 1. We will be reading a short passage from there here in just a few moments. Certainly want to welcome everyone that is here this morning. We are so glad to see the number out, especially those that are visiting with us. We want to welcome you and invite you back at any time that you're able to be with us. We invite you to Follow along with us this morning in our lesson. Open your Bibles and don't take my word for anything. Don't take anyone else else's word for anything here this morning, but go to the Bible. That is what we strive to do, um, not only when we are assembled together, but uh, each and every day. We strive to live as God would have us to by following His plain instructions that we find revealed in His Word. One of the problems I think so often we have as Christians is talking a good talk, but then not walking the walk. So often we come together on a morning such as this, and we sing songs like we've sung this morning, words about walking hand in hand with Jesus. And we sing those words with emotion and with passion, But then we leave here, and the way in which we live is not walking hand in hand with Christ, but really we walk hand in hand with ourselves. And maybe even at times we walk hand in hand with Satan himself. I can remember growing up one particular occasion where we were assembled on Sunday morning and we were singing together and the song that we happened to be singing was Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And the reason that I remember that particular morning and that particular singing of that song is because as we sang, we were all sitting down. And here I am singing, Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And I'm sitting down. And I remember the whole time just thinking to myself, something just doesn't seem right about this. We need to be standing up. I use that story to illustrate the point that I've already alluded to, the fact that so often we say something, we claim to be wanting to stand up for Jesus Christ in our lives, stand up for what is right, stand up for the truth. But so often our actions show us to be sitting down and not standing up at all. You have your Bibles open there to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to read in verse 27. Paul there says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. This morning we want to talk for just a short while about courage. We want to be individuals, we want to be children of God who walk worthy of the gospel by which we have been called. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are not ashamed of the gospel. As Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God for salvation to each and every one who believes. Are we living in such a way, are we walking in such a way that we are showing ourselves to be ashamed of that gospel? that gospel that has set us free from the sins that we have committed and given us hope of an eternal life someday in heaven with God. To not be ashamed and to stand up requires courage. And this morning we want to, as we've said, talk about courage and why we need it, where it comes from, when we need it, so that ultimately as we leave here this morning and as we go throughout this week, we can be individuals, we can be Christians who truly stand up 
for Christ in our lives. As we begin, we ask the question, why courage? And the first point that I believe we need to understand as we consider that question is, we are at war. Each and every day of your life, you are at war. And this battle is one that takes place within your very mind. It's one that has been written about countless different passages throughout the entire Word of God. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 12 and 13, Paul said, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This war that we are fighting, these battles that we participate in on a daily basis, they're not physical battles. We're not picking up physical swords and shields and going out to fight a physical enemy. But we are battling against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And therefore we are admonished to take up the whole armor of God that we might be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. You are presented each and every day with a number of choices. You can choose to do the right thing or you can choose to do the wrong thing. Certainly as we consider the choices we make on a daily basis, there are many frivolous choices. What am I going to eat for breakfast? What am I going to wear today? Of course, maybe that in and of itself isn't so frivolous if you really think about it. But there are important decisions on a daily basis. We are called to either take a stand for the truth, take a stand for what is right, or choose to, in cowardice, do things that would be against the very will of God. And we have to make those decisions. We have to choose who we are going to obey, who we are going to follow, who we are going to serve. In Joshua chapter 1, if you want to turn back to Joshua chapter 1, we're going to be coming back to this particular passage quite frequently here in the next few minutes. Here we find Joshua as he began to lead the children of Israel. The Lord is admonishing him as to how he needs to go about his new duties in taking the reins, so to speak, of leading these children of Israel into the promised land. And we find the Lord saying, Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, for you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, he asks? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I think in this passage here we see three different things in regards to why we are to have courage. The first that we'll notice is that God commands it. Why would God command us to be courageous? Well, because He understands that it is required if we want to have success against the temptations and the sinful allurements that we face on a daily basis. We see highlighted there three different times in this passage where uh, God said very plainly, be strong, be courageous. In Hebrews chapter 10, we find a similar sentiment conveyed. In verse 35 there, the Hebrew writer says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you might receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, if he's a coward, we could say, my soul has no pleasure in him. But notice, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Courage is commanded of those that would put on that armor of God. We see also that in this passage in Joshua chapter 1, as to why we should have courage is the Lord has pledged His support. The Lord has said, 
I will be with you. You're not alone in these things that you are going to face. Very last part of verse 9, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Again, we find similar thought conveyed in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 there. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The final thing I think we see in this passage is that we are promised success. Promised, guaranteed success. If we will have courage, we will understand that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that God is with us in all these endeavors that we face. He says, you will have good success. You will have victory. You know, it's not something that is seen very often in a physical war, a physical battle, where one side can say, we've already won. Those things are still up in the air. The battle is yet to be fought. But we can know that we will be victorious in our battle with sin because God has said, you will have success. Paul, at the, near the end of his life, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have had courage. I have kept the faith, he says. Henceforth there is laid up for me the, the crown of righteousness. Notice he's, he's not hypothesizing, well, maybe the crown is there. Hopefully it's there. No, he says it is there. The crown of righteousness awaits me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. So why courage? We are at war. God has commanded it so that we can be successful. He understands that it's a requirement for success. He's pledged his support. Let us know that he is going to be by our side each and every step of the way. And if we do these things, as we've noticed here, success can be ours. Where does it come from? Well, I think that we've obviously touched on the fact already that this courage comes from God himself. He is the ultimate root of all positive attributes that we are called to take upon ourselves. In 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6 regarding David here, we're told that David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But notice, David strengthens himself in the Lord, his God. His source of strength was in the Lord. And that is accomplished through a number of different avenues. The first being, again, as we notice from Joshua chapter 1, through the word of God. You notice as Joshua was admonished here to be courageous and to have strength in the face of the things that he was going to face, that the requirement on his part was that he would be obedient and study and meditate upon the laws of God that had been revealed. Where he's, he was told there to not depart from it to the right hand or to the left. He was told to meditate it, uh, meditate on it day and night and be careful to do all that was written in the law. And likewise today, we gain strength as we spend time in the Word. For how else are we going to understand what God's will is for us? But to go to what He has revealed. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Where does that armor come from? Right here. The Word of God. As he begins to describe those things, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We come to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. We are admonished to do our best to present ourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed by rightly handling the word of truth, by studying it and taking it as it is, not adding to it or taking away from it. The proverb writer says in Proverbs 28 and verse 1, he says, the wicked flee even when no one is pursuing them. Isn't that interesting? But notice, the righteous are bold as a lion. If we want to be righteous, 
we've got to go to the source of training in righteousness, don't we? And if we will do that, we can have that courage, we can have that boldness to stand firm in the face of trials and, 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 and temptations. We also see that another avenue through which we receive courage is through the avenue of prayer. There at the very end of Paul's remarks concerning this spiritual armor, he encourages the saints there uh, to be praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. And then he says to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me. He begins to make a personal request. He says that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I might declare it boldly as I ought also to speak. Paul realized that if he was to have the boldness and the courage that he needed to speak the word in the way that he needed to speak it, that he needed the prayers of his, his brethren. And undoubtedly he himself went to God in prayer and, and asked for the courage to do what needed to be done. And we need to do that very same thing. Which leads us into our next point here. The final avenue that I believe we gain courage from is, is from each other. Paul certainly prayed for himself, but he understood that he needed his brethren's support and their prayers as well in order to be all that he could be. In Hebrews chapter 10, we are admonished there in verse 24 to consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, he says, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, that final day of judgment. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Finally, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11, Therefore encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. If we will remember that, first of all, God is the ultimate source of the courage that we need to face sin and to face trials in this life. And we will go to His Word and meditate on His Word and go to Him in prayer and ask for the strength that we need and lean upon each other as fellow soldiers in this great war that we are fighting. And we will be able to have that courage that we so desperately need. And so when do we need courage? I think we could easily say that we always need courage, don't we? But I want to notice together this morning a few specific instances, a few specific a set of circumstances that courage is especially needed in our walk through this life. The first of which is when we are in the minority. If you want to turn your Bibles back with me to Genesis chapter 6, we have an image up there of Noah, as he stood before all of his fellow human beings, as he was preparing the ark, we go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 and find that Noah was a preacher of righteousness as he was preparing the ark and getting things ready for the flood that God had told him would come. He was trying to warn others and preach to them to repent and to change their ways because God was going to destroy the earth. Of course, we see that despite his efforts... Uh, Men did not heed his warnings, and, and we find that Noah was in the minority. In Ephes or Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, beginning there, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him up, uh, to his heart. And so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But in verse 8 he says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So often in our lives, you and I are just like Noah today. We are in the minority as we seek to live by the standards that God has set in place and seek to glorify Him in the way that He would be glorified. Most of the world isn't interested in that. The majority of human beings here on this earth, sadly, want nothing to do with God. Would rather just really 
think that he doesn't even exist so that they don't have to give an account to anything higher than themselves. And so in that situation, in those situations, we especially need to have courage because we are called to be the light of the world. Like Noah, we are called to warn those that are walking in darkness so that they could come to the light and be saved. Are we going to save everybody? Well, we understand that we're not going to save everybody. We know that the way is wide and the, uh, the gate is wide and the way is um, easy that leads to destruction. And many there are going to be that follow in there. But are we doing our part? Are we having the courage to stand up and speak the truth despite the fact that the rest of the world or the majority of the rest of the world would want nothing to do with God? In 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 it says, therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, referring to those that are sinful and practicing sinful things. He says, touch no unclean thing, and then I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. The question was asked to Christ in Luke chapter 13 and verse 23. Someone said to him, Lord, those, uh, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through that narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. One of the dangers, as we've noted there in 2 Corinthians 6, of being in the minority is that we are pressured on a daily basis by the majority. Many times to walk in ways and to do things that would not be right before God. And so we especially need courage in these types of situations. We also need courage as we face civil authorities many times. In our day and age, in the country that we live in, we have been very blessed to have not had to be the subject of laws that would prohibit us from a civil perspective, from assembling together to worship and to do things that God has asked us to do. But there have been Christians down through the ages that have had to suffer those things. And in different parts of the world today, there are those that suffer that type of a persecution and oppression. You, know, you go back to the times of Christ in the Roman Empire and the time of the apostles following that where the Roman Empire was putting Christians to death because of their faith. Many times, and, many time, and it may be that in the future we have to face similar circumstances. Back in Daniel chapter 3, we had the story there of three young men by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And... If you recall, they lived in a time where Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon and he had set up this large golden statue and he had commanded that on a certain time of the day uh, when music was played that everyone in the kingdom was to bow and to worship this image that he'd set up, this false god, this false idol. But we see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had the courage to resist giving in to those civil laws, that civil authority that was commanding them to do something that was against the will of God. If you turn with me over there to Daniel chapter 3. And we'll notice here verse 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. This physical destruction that the king had threatened these three men with. They said, He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You see the great courage that these three young men had, and we see the result of that, don't we? As they were cast into that fiery furnace, they stood within it completely unscathed. The fires could not touch them. And we see that one like the Son of Man stood with them and gave them protection. And ultimately they were delivered and through their faith and their courage they actually converted the king to change his mind about the laws that he had put in place. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12 we're told, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. We need to understand that these types of trials are going to come in our lives, these tests of our faith. He says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, he says, you're blessed, 
because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in that name. We need to have courage as we face temptation. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 39. And here we read about Joseph and Potiphar's wife. You recall that Joseph had been given a place of preeminence in the kingdom in Potiphar's house. He, he was his second in command over all of his house. And that Potiphar's wife had taken a liking to Joseph and had begun to try and allure him and tempt him to come and, and lie with her. Let's start reading in uh, the second part of verse 6 there. It says, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house uh, than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except for you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were there, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, notice, and fled and got out of the house. How often do we have the courage of Joseph when we are faced with temptation? How often do we flee the scene, completely remove ourselves from the situation in which we are facing that temptation? So often I think we're all guilty of staying there in the heat of that allurement and flirting with it. And oftentimes we succumb to it. But we need to have the attitude of Joseph. We need to have the courage of Joseph in asking the question, how can I do this great wickedness? How can I sin against my God? And being willing to flee from the temptations that we face. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure. We can always escape temptation. But it takes, first of all, a knowledge of what is right, what we ought to be doing in that situation, and then the courage and the boldness to stand up and do it. To stand up and take that way of escape. So oftentimes we don't have that courage. James 4 and verse 7 tells us, Submit yourselves before God. Resist the devil. And what will be the result? He will flee from you. Why is that? Well, because when we align ourselves with Almighty God, Satan doesn't stand a chance. And if we're clinging to God and resisting his temptations, he will leave. Because he cannot overcome the strength of God the strength through which we are able to have success. We need to have courage when there are times that we must rebuke sin and proclaim the truth, just as Nathan did before King David. If you come back with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12, if you recall, David had made a number of mistakes in his life. He had lusted after Bathsheba to the point that he had uh, taken her and, and committed adultery with her. And after doing so, he tried to cover it up uh, by uh, getting it to look as if Bathsheba's wife was the one that had been with her. And when that didn't work, he ended up putting Uriah to death. You recall, he put him out on the front lines of the battle so that he would surely be killed. But we find that Nathan comes before David in courage Certainly, Nathan could have been put to death for, for dare speaking against the king. But he had the courage to rebuke David because of his sinful actions and to proclaim the truth of what needed to be done by David. In verse 7, the first part of the chapter there, Nathan had told kind of a, a parable in a sense, a story about this man who had this little ewe lamb that was like a, a, a daughter to him and how that someone had came and taken that, that sheep and, and killed it to prepare for someone that was visiting with them. And David becomes furious at this and, and says, this man you know, ought to be put to death because of, of his actions. 
But Nathan brings to light the fact that David is the guilty party here. In verse 7, Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you of the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be yours and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house uh, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor that he lie with them in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. We see the courage that Nathan had here as he rebuked David for his sins. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verses 1 and 2, here Paul is exhorting young Timothy. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And it's not that we are to go out here and take our Bibles and you know, we see somebody doing something wrong, we just start beating them over the head with it and say, that's wrong. We do it with love. We do it out of a caring for their soul's salvation. But nonetheless, we are to rebuke. We are to reprove those who are practicing things that are contrary to the will of God. And we need courage to do that. Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, notice the sentiment of Jeremiah as he is talking about his mission to go and proclaim to Judah of their sins and to rebuke them for the way that they have turned against the Lord. He says, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones and I am weary with trying to hold it in. He says, I cannot. Do we have that type of passion? That type of passion that leads us to be courageous to stand up for the truth and to proclaim the truth not only by our words but especially by our actions we can go out and speak all we want but if we don't back it up by the way we're walking the way that we're living it really doesn't mean a lot and it's not going to have any kind of meaningful impact on those around us is it and so we need to have courage as we proclaim the truth finally we need to have courage when there are times that we need to admit that we're wrong. And there's going to be lots of those. <laughs> we are called to be perfect, but despite our intentions and our desires to be perfect, so often we fall short of that mark, don't we? And we do things and we succumb to things that we ought not to succumb to. But in those situations, we need to have the courage to admit that we were wrong and to make a change for the better. And we see this, that is exactly what David did. As we, If you still have your Bibles open there to 2 Samuel chapter 12. After Nathan had rebuked David because of his sin, we see how David had reacted. David said to Nathan there in verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. He admitted, yes, I have made these mistakes. I have done these things that I ought not to have done. We see in Psalm 51, David really pouring out uh, his emotions towards the Lord because of these, these things that he had committed. In verse 1, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. It takes courage to admit you're wrong. It takes cowardice to try and cover it up or make excuses for it. God calls us to be courageous. God says, when you do wrong, admit you've done wrong. Learn from that and turn from the wrong and, and follow what is right. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. And so do we have courage in these types of situations when we are in the minority, when we are facing perhaps civil authorities who are imposing laws that would be contrary to God's will, when we're facing temptations on a daily basis, when we are called to rebuke sin and to take a stand and proclaim the things of truth, and when we are called to acknowledge, yes, I have sinned. And I need to change and do better. I would encourage you this morning as we begin to bring our thoughts to a close to determine to stand up. Don't just sing about it. Don't just talk about it. But go out and stand up for Christ. He stood up for you. Look at what all He's done for you. He left heaven. You know, we all long to be in that heavenly home. He was there. And he left there to come here to this world that has been plagued by the results and the consequences of sin, death and suffering and pain. He endured temptation after temptation and ultimately he endured death on a cross. All for you and for me. He took a stand so that we might have life. Won't you take a stand for him? Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 32, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Let's acknowledge Christ by the way that we live and the things that we say and do. 1 Samuel chapter 17, you know, sometimes we get to thinking, well, this temptation that I'm facing is just too big, it's too great, it's too powerful, it's too strong. This trial that I'm enduring is just too hard. The load is too heavy, and I just can't do it. I invite you to come back and remember what David faced when he stood up in courage to do battle with the giant Goliath. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 45, we find David addressing this Philistine who had just previously referred to him as a a dog. Why have you presented me with this, this worthless dog to try and do battle with me? But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with the sword and spear, For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. We can overcome all the giants, quote unquote, of this life if we will rely upon the Lord. And remember that the battle is the Lord's. Success comes through Christ, through the strength that he provides us. And so let's stand up. Let's not be ashamed. But let's take a stand for what's right and let's do what's right when we're faced with those decisions on that daily walk. Paul said, what shall we say to these things? He'd just been talking about the great salvation that's been provided through Jesus Christ. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If you have the almighty creator of the very universe in which you exist by your side, How can you be scared? How can you doubt? How can you shrink back? I'm not saying that we should go out and start jaywalking across busy interstates and jumping in front of cars and jumping off big buildings and saying, I can do everything through Christ. We understand that this is spiritually that he's talking and and reasoning. And God is for our soul and our spirit and for the success 
of our soul and our spirit. He wants to see us in heaven with him someday. And that's why he's done all that he's done. And that's why he's provided all that he's provided. So that we can be there. One final scripture. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. We are admonished. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And about which you made the good confession. In the presence of many witnesses. This morning... Do you have courage? Have you been exhibiting courage in your life? Have you been taking a stand and fighting that good fight of faith? If not, we would encourage you this morning to seriously consider making some changes. Realizing the great power that lies behind you. The great God who wishes to see you succeed. And if you will only but rely upon His strength, you will succeed. If you're not a Christian here this morning and you never obeyed the gospel of Christ, never been baptized for the remission of your sins, we would encourage you before you leave here this morning to do that. Why go out into this world and face uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen to you if your life were to come to an end? Why not know where you're going, know where you're headed, and know the power that is with you and that has delivered you that will take you there. Whatever your need might be this morning, we would ask that you would make it known. Please come to the front as we stand and as we sing this song.